morning. Good morning, Commissioner. This is Maxine. Can you hear me? Madam Chair. So how many Friday going? Going. <laughs> You're starting us off. Um, okay, well, thank you for um, being able to, to speak to us today. And no problem. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, just uh, confirming I'm on the same page. We're on six ten, right? Correct. Excellent. Um, well, thanks for having me. And I'll, I know you have a busy uh, day. Uh, um, it, and I should probably just ask for a placeholder. Were there any? Uh, did anything evolve from yesterday morning's draft? Um, if so, I, I don't. Uh, what I have is version. <laughs> Um, which I think uh, was yesterday morning, so I just want to make sure I'm on the correct page. Version 4.1, did you say, uh, Commissioner? Uh, four, is it 4.1? Is that right? Yes. 4.1, yes. okay. 2.35 p.m.? Yes, that's, that's, what we, that's what we're working off of. Great. Okay, so I'm, I'm on the same page. Uh, so... Uh, I think we just have a couple of things to uh, to offer on the draft, and they relate specifically to the search warrant uh, component in the wake of an abuse prevention order, okay. and then firearm storage, which I was going to address with you anyway, but I understand the, uh, the Bronx Police Association introduced some possible language, or suggested some possible language about uh, the state adopting more responsibility for firearm storage. So those are the two things that I was going to talk about, and I think I can do them both in three or four minutes and then take any questions and, and go from there. Okay. Um, no need to, no so, need to rush, so okay. that's fine. Yeah, thank uh, you. So the, um, the spirit of um, ensuring that we are uh, taking firearms should the rest of the construct of the abuse prevention order language um, Pass and even under the, the current uh, operating methodology, if a, if a judge was to order um, firearms to be relinquished pursuant to a, an abuse prevention order, uh, the spirit of where you're headed and that being a priority uh, and using a search warrant if necessary to obtain those firearms, I think we agree with um, the where the uh, I guess where our concern is is excuse me, Commissioner. The, can you Commissioner, sorry, this is Maxine, sorry for interrupting you. Um, so um, can you please, can you repeat what you said in terms of what you agree with? I just want to make sure I... We agree with the spirit of it being a priority to, uh, if, if a, a, a court order indicates that firearms should be relinquished, um, that uh, law enforcement should be and I think largely does um, follow up on that uh, if there's an indication uh, that that has that compliance with that order has not occurred, and a search warrant is one tool in the toolbox that we have already uh, to be able to follow up and investigate whether that uh, order is not being complied with or uh, conversely is being violated. Um, the, where we have some questions is around the methodology to do that. And I think you probably heard yesterday from a couple of witnesses in the law enforcement realm that are suggesting that the existing framework of Rule 41 already allows for this. And I think we would echo um, that uh, testimony and say that we do believe we've got the tools necessary uh, should the judiciary uh, issue an order uh, on an abuse prevention order, whether it's temporary or final, um, where firearms need to be relinquished, uh, then really all it takes from that point is uh, a standard investigation to determine whether probable cause exists to believe that the person hasn't complied with that, and that would take the form of primarily witness uh, interviews, and then we could apply for a search warrant and uh, in. Con you know, in circumstances that we could tightly control, uh, go in and obtain those either using a search warrant or a, a warrantless search exception. So that's a really long way of saying, um, I don't know that the added language that's being suggested here is necessary. Um, and the, uh, then going a, a step further, my fear is always when we make the operating environment more complicated, 
we create the possibility uh, for error. And unfortunately, the operating environment in uh, law enforcement gets increasingly complex every year. And uh, both uh, law enforcement leaders, the executive branch, and I know the judiciary are looking for ways to improve outcomes and reduce the error rate, um, adding complexity uh, takes us, unfortunately, in a different direction. So that's a really long way of saying, let's do this in the most simplistic, easily reproducible way possible that is likely using Rule 41 and uh, and sort of working from there as the, the foundation rather than creating a separate construct for that. Um, we are also, as a placeholder, um, I'm eager to, can you still hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm eager to, uh, to talk with the committee more about our overall modernization strategy, which I think would help to inform a lot of uh, the things contemplated uh, in this bill, in particular the, the data, the workflow behind how some of these things uh, actually happen. Uh, and. If we improve, some, we're actively working to improve some of our systems and taking a systems approach to trying to produce re reproducible results on any uh, event that we're responding to, whether it's domestic violence or an accident or a crisis scenario um, or anything else, um, that's the approach we're taking to try to improve the outcomes on all of these things. Uh, and an extension of that, I was uh, talking with uh, Major Jonas just a couple of days ago about uh, implementing more systems and checklists. And she indicated that we are uh, in the midst of drafting a uh, domestic violence checklist. Uh, they exist in some forms now, and we have them for certain components of DB. Uh, but to try to improve outcomes, uh, one of the things we're working on is a comprehensive uh, checklist for law enforcement that can be used to ensure outcomes. And one of the things we put on there uh, in, that would dovetail into whatever passes in, in 610 uh, around ensuring that uh, we're checking abuse prevention orders for all the components and then ensuring that we're pulling on any requisite threads of evidence that someone may be in violation, in particular, uh, you know, travel. Uh, contact and firearms or the, the would be the high risk uh, areas of abuse prevention order violations. So um, we're doing a lot of background work uh, to systematize the way things get done uh, is the, the moral of that piece of the puzzle. Uh, let's see here. Um, excuse me, uh, <coughs> there's, there's a question. Yeah, uh, a few questions. This is uh, Martin Lalonde. Um, before you move on to storage, unless you had some additional comments on this component of it. No, I think it's, it's, it's I'll take questions anytime. Uh, it'll, it'll likely intersect something I was gonna say anyway, so. Okay, so so just you know, by way of background, what, uh, what we're trying or what I'm trying certainly to do with this component of the bill uh, is really uh, twofold. Uh, it's, I do understand law enforcement uh, takes these orders very seriously. Uh, but <clears throat> having the sense of urgency uh, is one component of it, uh, making sure that uh, this is being followed up, particularly with the temporary order, uh, very expeditiously. Uh, the other, uh, equally if not more important, is uh, transparency. Uh, the transparency of what has been done as far as getting the firearms relinquished, uh, whether that is at the time the order is served and relinquished uh, or uh, following up with a warrant and such. And the transparency is as much uh, for the sense of safety of the victim uh, as anything, really. Uh, and that's kind of the, the ideas behind what we're trying to do with this. Uh, we're also at the same time not trying to complete, you know, we're not trying to modify really the warrant process. Um, I mean, I don't think anything we have in here, unless I've missed something, uh, has, uh, is different or undermines the fact that Rule 41 would have to be followed. So uh, that's kind of the, the concept behind this, and that's why, you know, just let me ask a couple specific questions and follow up. <coughs> as far as in, in E1, uh, this is on page 11, uh, this is where the ex parte uh, temporary order is served, uh, and 
the expectation is, and you can tell me if this is if I'm wrong about this, but the expectation is that uh, at that time, uh, law enforcement would uh, go over the order, and if there's a relinquishment order, would presumably request at that time the relinquishment of the firearms. Is, am I wrong about that process? I'm trying to find that section right now. Yeah, it's on page 11, the bottom of page 11, line 16 to 20. Uh, what's the section number? Uh, section E1. Yeah, the version I'm looking at is one that uh, the VPA sent me, so it's got okay. the lines got messed up uh, All right, because sure. there were some suggested edits on their part. So e, I'm looking at E1. Now, complaint for ex parte uh, temporary order is the first piece. So, we return. So, the, so I was actually my initial reaction is uh, that the return of service is the man. It, it would be the best method for creating this transparency that you're talking about. So. Um, the officer's got to complete the return of service and uh, having them address um, any components of the order that relate to firearms, that's, that wouldn't be an additional burden. Um, and uh, I think that would create the requisite documentation that we need. I should uh, let you know that uh, among the modernization things we're doing is we're moving rapidly to a statewide electronic uh, electronically based warrant system and then the follow-up to that will be to bring abuse prevention orders onto that electronic system so the current methodology in Vermont is that there are holding stations departments that hold paper copies of these things spread all over the state and there is a combination of telephone email um, uh, law enforcement telecommunications network um, a closed system of uh, communication that happens uh, to uh, verify those things and then we move paper copies back and forth between courts. We're going to a uh, an electronic version of that. Uh, it'll probably take the better part of a year to implement uh, to get it out to all the courts. Um, that, that's the main piece. Uh, law enforcement training for that's pretty straightforward. That will allow us once we move to the APO side of that, it will allow for an electronic version of the uh, return of service, which we can then mine data on. So right now, the paper form is hand filled out. In the future, we'll be able to do that and actually get uh, live data up to the minute on how many are active, how many have been served, um, and how many instances there have been uh, indications that someone's violating uh, a provision on the possession of firearms, for example. Right, so that, that will be great. I don't think that necessarily changes the approach uh, in the bill requiring a return of service. And we had some testimony yesterday. I think that we will be reacting to that. And, and uh, I think the concept that I'll just flow to you since we have you right now uh, is that we will uh, have specific questions on the return of service uh, so that we're, we're actually making very specific what, what we want to understand. And, and it would really, the three questions that I come to mind are whether there was relinquishment of firearms and what they were, uh, if there wasn't relinquishment, uh, whether the uh, law enforcement is uh, following up as far as pursuing a war and such. Uh, and then actually third, if it's a vacate uh, the premises type order, uh, what is the ad mailing address for the individual uh, going forward? There may be other questions, but the concept is to, to make it more routine as far as the exact uh, information that we're trying to get back. And whether that's on the paper form currently or an electronic form, that I believe doesn't matter. But that's, if you could comment on that concept, and that came uh, in part from uh, Chief Burke suggesting that we be specific what we want to know and have questions uh, on a return of service form. You know, I, I think you're on the right track there. That does create additional complexity. It's a form that's already being filled out. Uh, whether it's electronic or paper doesn't matter. The electronic uh, version will have some advantages in our ability to track it more quickly. Um, but I think that it, that is a good approach to uh, accomplishing what you've uh, described the intent is. 
So I think the, the concept as well is that, all right, we get a return of service, uh, hope, uh, presumably uh, fairly rapidly after, the, after it has been served. Um, we, we have some language trying to make sure that that's happening. Uh, and I guess the second step is if they, the weapons aren't relinquished and a warrant is going to be sought, uh, then presumably there's a uh, return of service on the warrant, or there's, uh, as my my understanding. Um, yeah, that is part of the process now. So it's also important to understand that we may have probable cause to believe there are firearms still present, and the uh, defendant is violating the conditions of the abuse prevention order and or their conditions of release, or both. And a warrant not always the method. Uh, the methodology to get those firearms. There are uh, exceptions to, to the search warrant requirement. They're relatively narrow, but they are used um, in order to get compliance uh, as well. So a warrant's not always necessary. And would that presumably occur at the time when the law enforcement is serving the order? Uh, I think it depends on a variety of circumstances. Uh, it's where the order is being served. Um, you know, how many are there? Other people at the residence? Um, what are uh, what are the circumstances of the event? The underlying event itself? Is there some ongoing exigency? Has the defendant just made uh, a threat and is uh, not at the residence right now? But can you articulate an exigent circumstance that would? Uh, obviate the need for a warrant. Um, there's an innumerable number of potential variables. Okay, so it seems I think that um, as far as the transparency component, uh, the return of service is the appropriate place, and, and I think we'll be working on language hopefully to make that clearer. The other issue, though, is uh, what I call the urgency, and we do have language in here now. Uh, and this is uh, subsection E2 uh, and E3, but E2 is talking about the return of service. And I mean, it'll have to be modified a little bit because I don't think we're talking about necessarily having the affidavit with the return of service. We're having in, instead uh, answering a question of whether uh, they're still seeking prob probable cause. Uh, any event, we have there as far as the earliest possible time and taking precedence over other summons and orders. And if you could comment on that, and if you uh, don't agree with that, if you have any other um, suggestions of how we can kind of underline the urgency of this process. Uh, that's a great question. I think you start by that, that, that message begins to be sent by adding what you're suggesting to the return of service. Um, so I would take an, a sort of an iterative approach to this. I would take that step uh, and then measure what we're seeing as a result and then determine whether we need to take more affirmative measures uh, to push people to prioritize. I think by and large, uh, it's rare to see, uh, in the 30 years I've been doing this, it, it's very rare to see folks not uh, take seriously something that needs to be followed up on that's of a serious nature, and DB is in that is in that bucket. Um, uh, I think we spend an equal amount of time um, trying to get officers to. to I mean, this is an equa a balancing equation, right? We want you to slow down uh, in certain circumstances, and that is an equal part of uh, of this. So I've I I have a variety of fears around creating a, uh, a statutory push or prioritization of any one thing because once you open that box then what what is and how do you prioritize everything else do you have to then create something that says well this goes above that and this goes below this and there's just no way to do that because the operating environment changes so rapidly that you you wouldn't be able to create a construct for that um, prioritizing it above other summons and uh, service of subpoenas and things like that, you, you could write that down, um, but that's the way it works already. That's the common sense approach. Um, and in that regard, I, I would caution you against trying to legislate common sense um, because that's another conversation that could never end. You could end up in all kinds of different. Uh, scenarios where people are asking you to put something above something else. It's, 
emergency services just doesn't lend itself to that kind of structure because you just, it, it, for the same reason, uh, my last answer was it depends on a variety of circumstances. Same thing. I was at the Shaftesbury Barracks yesterday, that's why I couldn't be with you. Um, and a fatal accident came in. Does what takes precedence? Is it the firearms or is it the closed road with uh, with, with a deceased driver? Uh, it, it depends on a variety of circumstances. What's the nature of the DV case? Um, is there an ongoing threat? Where is the victim? Is the victim secure? So it, there's just no way to do that. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I understand that, and that's uh, we actually had narrowed it from a broader prioritization to the summons and orders. It sounds like that's already practice. Um, I think just a couple other questions, Mark, maybe others. For, for oh yeah, sure. just because for clarification purposes, um, you, you in your testimony you referenced some other language that was being proposed. I don't know what you're talking about. And it's making it difficult to follow along with some of the. I know that you're going through a series of questions about stuff that's in the bill, right? But there was a reference to some other potential language that it would be helpful to have to look over. Right, the VPA proposal, which you, I don't. Is it does anyone have that? We I was told it was posted it's on. Post, there. It's posted. Yeah, they they're they're coming <coughs> next week. Oh, okay. That's what he's referring to. It's a VPA proposed yeah. language. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. Sure. And when we get to storage, I think we'll hear it conceptually. There is language, but we'll hear it conceptually on that. But I guess my last uh, question or issue is we have a provision um, uh, regarding uh, follow follow up. If there isn't action right at the time of service, uh, that the def if the defendant doesn't relinquish firearms and the law enforcement officer doesn't have uh, probable cause to seek a warrant right then, but instead has a reasonable suspicion and wants to essentially do more investigation, we say yeah, investigate uh, this as soon as practicable. Uh, we say 48 hours or as soon as practicable, but. Uh, the concept there is, again, that if there hasn't been relinquishment, uh, we want to know what is happening, uh, particularly for the, for the victim's sense of security and safety again, that something is happening, that, that uh, the law enforcement is seeking to establish probable cause. And the other point is that we would you know, we'd like something uh, that would tell us uh, if probable cause wasn't established, if law enforcement is no longer trying to seek those firearms. And part of that information is not just for the safety of the victim, but also going into uh, presumably the final you know, order and, and the hearing on the final order. But if you have another concept uh, of how that information can get back to the court and therefore the victim, it would certainly be open to understanding that. But I just wanted to let you know what our concept was behind that provision. This is in I would build it into our new records management system that uh, I'm actually, I stepped out of a demonstration with third of three vendors that's demonstrating. I would build it into the data system. Um, because that's the best way to get the kind of information you're talking about. Uh, I would, again, I would not, it, it's, it's creating a, a, a statutory uh, direction for investigation. I don't know of any other place in statute where that exists. And I think it's opening Pandora's box. And it's making the assumption that this is not happening already. And I, I have never seen an instance where any component of an abuse prevention order or conditions of release have not been actively uh, investigated. Um, it's just, it's not to say it couldn't happen, but I've been involved with a variety of departments over 30 years. I've never seen it happen. It assumes that there are, uh, there are uh, that multiple things have failed. We've hired the wrong person. We've not trained them. We don't have adequate policy. We don't have adequate supervision. Um, and while we, there is occasionally error, the error is still going to happen um, if, even if it's in statute because all these other things have failed already and our policies by and large um, already speak to all of this. They say you will investigate um, and you will prioritize things based on risk and it just, 
it, unless there's, we have data that indicates that this isn't being done, I would set it aside for now. That, no, that sounds, I, I, I understand where you're coming from on that. I guess putting aside the directive of what law enforcement should be doing, uh, it, I guess I'm as much, if not most, concerned with, with again, the court and therefore the victim uh, having access or understanding what is being done. So it's more the transparency for the victim and for the court uh, than pushing the investigation along or telling them how to do the investigation. It's, it, it's that knowledge <coughs> component of it. And, and I'm hearing what you're suggesting is to build it into the new data system. And could we, I mean, would, one idea is to have in here somewhere uh, essentially a directive that that this be studied and determined, you know, as far as this information component and how that would be accommodated by this new data system. The, uh, that's a better approach, um, but I would also say, you know, our job and, and part, again, I would point back to our overarching modernization strategy. Um, <laughs> We're trying to take a holistic systems approach to this and many other things so that we're not chasing individual fragmentary outcomes. We're working to build a data system that can answer any and all relevant questions um, without having to uh, you know, chase a, a tiny fragment of an outcome. When we do that, we end up actually getting distracted and not being able to deliver the more robust results that uh, we really want to deliver. Um, and that actually dovetails perfectly into the storage piece, which um, I'll move to whenever you'd like. But I, I, it, I don't take my testimony as saying, no, we don't want to do this really more as a, we're taking a comprehensive approach to this and we're moving <coughs> as fast as possible. Um, just, and that's new just in the last five months. Um, so we'll have a lot more to report next year. Uh, but I fear that the more fragmentation there is, the less we're able to focus on getting results for everything, if that makes any sense. There are, as a, another placeholder, there are 220 bills that have been introduced in impact public safety operations. It's uh, difficult to navigate, to say the least, um, and it's a lot of fragmentary efforts that if we do a better job on the whole, we'll have all the answers and we'll have better results and we'll have better outcomes if we can just get the focus on the, it, it, I'm, I'm essentially saying let's go bigger and and get better results. So, so at a minimum, and, uh, and this is just me talking and there's many other interests and views on this, uh, actually requiring uh, your department to, to report back at, by a, a date certain sometime next uh, biennium on, on the data system, the modernization attempts uh, including, but not limited to, how this kind of domestic violence data uh, would be provided or available, something along those lines. I'm excited to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious. This, I mean, this is a core piece of uh, what the future has to look like for public safety, not just in the law enforcement realm, but the entire footprint of emergency management, fire safety, uh, et cetera. Thank you. I think those are all the questions on. That I have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. So, so storage? Storage. Um, the bottom line is I believe that the Department of Public Safety, uh, the state, should be the backup to when everything else fails uh, for the storage of firearms related to domestic violence and abuse prevention order cases once they reach the final stage. I'm not talking about the temporary stuff. Um, and it doesn't require statutory language to do that. We are actively writing and should have in the next couple of days uh, a draft MOU for agencies who uh, don't have any other options. Their storage capacity has been tapped out. Uh, Third-party storage is not available. It doesn't meet uh, the statutory criteria to go into the BGS process 
uh, and they're out of space, uh, the plan is to have them simply drop off uh, any excess firearms that they can't store uh, when they drop off evidence here at headquarters to the lab. I was talking about that a couple of months ago before uh, I even knew this bill existed. Um, so that's the direction we're moving. Um, and I would ask that you not pass legislation for no other reason than uh, the good faith effort at legislation to allow BGS to take the guns. Um, we needed that, so that wasn't optional, but the way the language was crafted uh, ended up being very confusing for a variety of different state lawyers, and there was a protracted delay to get it implemented, and um, I finally had to, when I got here, I had to say, enough debating with lawyers, we're going to simply do this, we're going to do it by MOU uh, with BGS, and uh, we had to do a workaround to make it work. So. Um, I would ask that you not pass uh, a law to do it. We're going to do it anyway, and we'll be able to do it faster without a statutory construct because we won't have lawyers fighting over how to implement it. So, so when you ask us, um, so there's nothing in 610. Um, I, I believe there's um, something. Yeah, I'm, re I believe I'm sorry, something. I'm responding to the VPA. Right, suggestion. exactly, exactly. That's what that was my question. Um, that, okay, so thank you. That's that's helpful. So, but but you're not saying to hold up H610. You're just saying don't put in the solution or try to solve the storage problem in this bill. Correct. We're going to solve the storage problem operationally. Um, it's, it's, Michael, this just strikes me as a silly conversation. We don't have a place to store things that are. Uh, that are evidentiary or um, are being seized by statute. It's a, it's a silly conversation. And I understand there are many small departments uh, and many large departments. I come from the largest municipal department in Vermont. Storage space was at a premium. I get that. But if this is all executing state law, this is about the state providing backup resources to those public safety entities. And that, again, I'll, uh, when I have a chance to walk into our modernization strategy, one large pocket of that is how we provide better support uh, to local and county public safety assets, uh, not only in law enforcement, but in fire safety and EMS and emergency management, and modernizing the way we do that. And I see this as an extension of that. If they need help to do something, the state should be there to help them do it. Uh, Matt, is that yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, in, in looking over, um, the, I, I appreciate what you're saying there and your attitude to sort of just get a, an ongoing problem fixed. Um, but I'm wondering if you had uh, an opportunity to sort of think about if you know what the uh, sort of the, the overall universal size of this is. Um, and as a second part of that, um, with the changes to um, confiscation of firearms, contemplated in 610, uh, do you see that uh, the size of that problem perhaps getting larger? Uh, it could get, well, we'll take them in reverse order, it could get larger, but we don't know the full universe uh, of that yet. I think the number is about 700 APOs a year. If someone in the room is nodding, then I'm right, and if they're shaking their head, then I'm wrong. Um, but uh, I there's no way to predict exactly what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, relative to uh, if we know the existing universe, is the deputy commissioner in the room? Yes. Okay. He can confirm that what I'm about to say is accurate, but my recollection is that there was a survey done of law enforcement agencies. We only got 18 or so responses, and the universe was about 200, maybe 220 firearms. 233, sir. Thank you. Uh, so that's what we know. And, and that's the universe of guns currently being held. How many of those would be overflow that would have to go somewhere else is a, is a different question. Mm -hmm. um, and I very much appreciate the um, the, the idea of saying to the legislature, please don't try to legislate something and fix it so that we don't accidentally ruin it. Um, but I do want to ask you, do you feel confident that you have, I'm, sorry, are you still there? 
You know, I made people disappear before, but so lovely. Um, okay. You push the red button, and I'll try to redact this. Maybe you should, maybe you should talk. I'm sorry. I can't stand this guy talking. I, that's what I would do if I were asking you on the speaker on my phone. I would have looked up my next. I have a picture on my phone if you want. You'll be fine. Does that work? Can we hear? It's a matter of whether or not we can all. How's that? Mike, go ahead and say. I can hear okay. If I lost you right as the question was about Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, outside of legislating, um, outside of legislating something, I do want to make sure that you feel fairly confident that to implement the plan that you're proposing to do internally, that you are able to do that within your existing appropriation, and that no additional funds would be necessary. Yes, I am. Uh, I am confident we can find. Uh, the requisite storage space and, and build the workflow uh, without having to spend a lot of money. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Can we circle back around to just sort of like a summary of that? Yeah, sure, anything. Yeah. Um, so I uh, just want to one more time just make sure that I'm understanding so you're a little bit concerned about uh, the legislation um, sort of mandating an order for you and are more comfortable with a, um, a sort of allow us to do our job and and um, and prioritize appropriately based on what you're seeing in the real world is that fair Yes, okay. and, uh, but at, you know, collecting some data on the, the return of service forms and then eventually collecting data using a modern um, record system will help to inform whether we've got, uh, whether everything else that I said should be working, the hiring, training, policy, supervision, uh, data is at the back end of that um, to cross check to make sure we are getting the results we want. Uh, I'm just asking for a little space to get there. Um, and if that all fails, then um, I don't think it will. But if it, in the, the off chance that it does, um, then we can come back to you and say, well, we weren't successful. So if you want, if you want to tell us uh, how to prioritize it and have at it. And luckily, I think we know where to find you also. So um, We have a three-digit phone number, which yeah. is nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other last question, just as a whole, um, is the Department of Public Safety in support of, opposed, or neutral on the legislation? On the other components of the legislation, um, we don't have a stance at this point. We've been sifting for the last uh, two weeks through uh, all of literally hundreds of bills, yep. and uh, we're taking them as they come with uh, uh, testimony, scheduled testimony. So, admittedly, we're a little behind the ball. We uh, we don't have the staff to get through everything. Um, so, I guess you could mark us as a as a neutral on uh, the the rest of it. We're we're focused on the parts that are operationally impacted. At this point. Is this one that you anticipate having a position on in the future, or just sort of reviewing and providing um, guidance and, and assistance as necessary? I think the latter is, is uh, probably the best bet on the other components of the bill. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So, thank you. Thanks for letting me do this by phone. Yeah, just one, one, more, one, yeah. one more question, actually. Uh, just I, I apologize. I need to back up about something we were discussing. Um, but uh, regarding the the service uh, return of service and the like, so is there is there a way until until the uh, new data system is in place? Uh, I think that the, what I'm trying to find or looking for is some sort of status that goes back to the court. Uh, some sort of status that goes back to the court. You know, there's been the order has been served. There's been a return of service out there. There's a question that talks about follow up if no firearms were relinquished, and it says that you know the law enforcement is following up or seeking a warrant or whatnot. But 
having a status of what happened with that is is my concern in the interim that some sort of information can go back to the court. I would understand that if a warrant is successful, there, there's a return of service on the warrant. Uh, but if they don't establish probable cause or the warrant's not executed for some reason, how is the court uh, informed of that or how can the court be informed of that? If there's a, a parallel domestic violence case, then that would all, or yeah, if there's a parallel domestic violence case, that would be part uh, of what the court could inquire of the officer or the prosecutor uh, in that process. But this would be um, this would be in the civil this will be a civil matter still presumably. It's an RFA that's a temporary RFA that's issued by civil by court in a civil proceeding. Yes, yeah, in most cases in Vermont, the judge sitting in a particular uh, uh, circuit is is hearing all of those. So there is some cross pollination of information. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind to be able to go back and uh, inquire of that or audit it is to, as you're asking the questions on the return of service form, um, you know, did this result in the seizure of firearms? If no, uh, is there an active investigation or is the investigation completed? So, you know, check those boxes and then ask for uh, the, the incident number. Um, that goes with that investigation, the case number uh, of the law enforcement agency. That way you have, until we get the electronic version going, um, and actually even if you have, maybe if we have the electronic version going, you have a way to at least randomly select uh, some of these or audit all of them potentially to find out what the outcomes were. Yeah, I'm not thinking of audit. I'm just thinking of setting up a process whereby the victim and the court understands uh, what has happened to any subsequent investigation after the return of service has been provided for the service of the order itself. That That's kind of what I'm trying the, to figure out. In the, ba the basic way that that would, the folks would have access to that, uh, the victim in particular would have access to that now by just asking for a copy of the investigation that they're party to um, and or calling the officer or if they're more comfortable doing that, calling a supervisor uh, to ask that question. Um, having the incident number uh, would, uh, would, it would allow for that, for them to be able to do that faster or somebody else to be able to ask uh, that question, particularly the court asking for an update on the status of that investigation. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Great. Commissioner, thank you very much. We really appreciate this. Thank you. Have yeah. a great weekend. Yeah, thanks. You too. Thank Talk you. Talk to you later. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. So, do you want to join us? And I will. Great, great. thank you. And, uh, Before we begin this, I still can't find that language. Is it possible for you to let me know where it is, the proposed language from the police association? Huh? Do you know what it'll be posted under, who the witness is? Um, yeah, that's about here. Uh, for an under Okay, thank you. Good morning. For the record, I'm uh, Christopher Herrick, Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, I, I guess uh, there's probably not a lot I can add unless you have other questions. Um, if you wanted to delve into specific areas that the commissioner didn't get into, um, I certainly can make myself, but I, I think he covered it pretty well. So, so can you talk a little bit more about uh, what's being done with respect to the holding station? Sure. Today? Uh, uh, Commissioner just mentioned that briefly, but if you could give us a little Yeah, I, I can do that. If you so, could tell us how it's, I mean, we've kind of heard of how it works now and what the vision is for. So there's nobody uh, mandated by statute to be responsible for the holding of them. Uh, they're issued, and so currently we have a, a variety of folks who do it, mostly state police, because it has to be a 24-hour agency. Um, but for local agencies do also um, handle them. For instance, Montpelier and Barry, um, Washington County Sheriff, holds, holds them for their area. 
but other agencies have in the past said we're not doing this anymore. We don't get reimbursed. It, it is a it's a workload issue, and we're uh, at uh, Department of Public Safety um, strapped as well in terms of being able to manage it. And so we began looking at this process, working with the judiciary. Um, and some of the other holding stations on coming up with a better way to manage it. It is arcane right now. Um, it, it's, it involves um, email, faxing, paper copies. Um, and it, exactly. And so we're trying to come into the 19th century. Um, and Burlington currently uses a system called Views. And we have... Um, work with them and we're going to implement it on a statewide level. So now the originating agency um, will be responsible for submitting the warrants and the and relief from abuse orders into the system and they'll still be 24-hour agencies but they'll have electronic access to them um, and law enforcement agency, agencies will be able to see them, uh, see what's active. Um, immediately once upon being entered. And so um, we expect, I don't know the timeline on that. We had hoped to do it fairly soon. I would imagine we'll probably have it up, at least beta testing, before you go home uh, by the end of the session. So. Do you think we're going really long, or you think you're going really fast? I think. Um, no, I'm just joking. Oh, you? About going before we go. You've already gone too long. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know when you're going to go home. Maybe you have a better sense of that. But um, it's going to be a nice spring in May. So that's the answer to that. We look forward to modernizing that. And it is in alignment with what the commissioner mentioned. Um, that we're modernizing all over the place. Um, kind of aside, we, we are streamlining our business process. We're trying to get rid of paper to the degree we can. For instance, e-citation um, is one of the projects uh, that I've been managing. Every state police cruiser is outfitted now with the ability to write um, tickets um, electronically. And one of the one of the benefits of that. Um, which might be of interest to this committee, is we've mandated responses so that we no longer will have, um, on the state police side, you can't finish a ticket if you haven't entered the race data. And so we won't, we'll no longer have gaps in that information like we have in some of the previous years. And we're rolling this out. Um, some local agencies have it now. And by the end of September, most of them should have it. So it should be a statewide implementation. And so that's that's really a, an exciting project. So not just the state police, but? Correct. There are some local agencies that have it now. Um, and we're in the midst of the first round of subgrants for this federal fiscal year. Uh, we'll be making awards soon. And then there'll be another wave um, in a few months. And then by the end of December, I mean the calendar year, the fiscal year for the feds ends in September. We get a little bit of a leeway with the uh, implementation, uh, but by the end of that time, any local agency who wants it should have it or will have it. And then it's there's a grant, it's a NHTSA grant that's paying for the installation, uh, so it's at no cost to them. So, can I answer any other questions? Great. I'll be, you know, you know where to get over me. Um, and if there's anything you need, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And um, H610, um, just. Uh, Thinking back to my testimony last time, you know, the majority of the bill that deals with uh, mandatory relinquishment of firearms with relief from abuse orders is a civil process. It doesn't really impact the criminal court or the state's attorneys unless there's violations. Um, so I would probably just limit my testimony to the sections that actually implicate the state's attorneys unless there's any questions about that. Um, which I'd be happy to answer. Um, 
I don't think many of their, I don't think there was many changes to the sections um, that implicate the state's attorneys other than um, the section on family members or household members seeking relief from abuse orders um, during court hours. Uh, um, I understand the court's concern. I think that was at their recommendation, and, and we're fine with that. Um, I don't think I mentioned last time, but this department uh, is fully supportive of Section 4, um, which um, extends prohibited person status to people that are uh, resp the respondent of an, uh, an emergency relief for abuse order. Um, Uh, to the extent that Section 1 protects public safety, the department uh, is certainly supportive of that. Um, I think there is a real public safety risk when a prohibited, when there's a default proceed for a prohibited person and then an ATF agent has to go and try and retrieve that firearm. I think that poses a significant public safety risk. Um, so we would extend you know, the, the approach taken in the bill or any other approach to close and narrow the Charleston before. Um, I'm not sure that there's much else that directly impacts the state's attorneys, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So you're, I just want to make sure I really heard you correctly. You're comfortable with the amendments to Section 6, and that, because I'm just recalling that in earlier testimony, we heard um, some questions raised about just the role of state's attorneys and st in standing um, around this expansion of who can file an ERPO, and so I just want to make sure I understand really sure. where we're at with this section. Right. I'm just providing a little more detail. And I don't think it's entirely clear um, what sort of, I mean, just to uh, take a step back, traditionally, state's attorneys and to a lesser extent, but I mean, they've got con concurrent jurisdiction. The Attorney General's office is the, are the gatekeepers of extremist protection right. orders. They hear from witnesses, they hear from law enforcement about whether to proceed with um, a petition. And they, have, they bear the burden of proof, and um, they have a continuing obligation to represent the state in the final order and in any appeals. This adds a new party to the mix, the household member. And I did have a question about whether that household member would carry that burden throughout the process. Uh -huh. And um, I think, I mean, just a straight reading of the bill, which is what any judge would do, would say that they have the continued obligation. I think that they could potentially work with the state's attorney if they uh -huh. wanted to. Uh -huh. um, but um, I think just a plain reading of the bill suggests that that household member would be the one to kind of, if they're seeking an emergency order, then seek the final order, and if there is an appeal, handle the appeal. That's just my reading of it. If, if they, I mean, it's something the committee should discuss, whether they want the state's attorney to assume the role, kind of stand in the shoes of the household member for any of those subsequent proceedings. But I don't think it would be required under this bill. I think okay. the household member could just continue. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair with the Attorney General's Office. So uh, I had a couple brief general remarks uh, about the updated version, and I've also been listening over the last couple days and have notes about specific issues that I've heard the committee ask about, and I thought I would go through those and uh, make some comments on those, which I hope will be helpful to the committee, um, be responsive to what you've been talking about in the last couple days, and obviously interrupt with questions as we go. 
Um, first, I just wanted to note our general support for the updated version. Uh, it took into account some of the concerns, or the intention certainly was to take into account some of the concerns we heard from the judiciary and operational concerns from police. We think those concerns are reasonable, and we think that uh, a good accommodation was made here to address those concerns. And uh, as more things might need to be tweaked, we'll be happy to help with that. A couple things I wanted to bring up in particular that we've heard about are several things. I'll sort of go through a couple of conceptual things, and then after that, go through a couple detail-oriented things. Um, one thing that got brought up yesterday was the constitutional review issue. And uh, Attorney Fitzpatrick did a good job of giving a summary of how that comes into play. But I just wanted to reiterate a couple points on that. One is that when we're talking about burdens of proof by which a court needs to um, find something like clear and convincing evidence or preponderance of evidence, that is really just directing the court about how they're going to make decisions. The question of constitutionality is whether the courts are allowed to make those decisions in the first place. So the burdens of proof that are in uh, any particular statute don't, don't directly go to that question. Uh, the constitutionality question gets addressed by the levels of scrutiny that Attorney Fitzpatrick talked about a bit yesterday. So I just wanted to separate those two concepts and make sure there was clarity there. Um, and when we look at that constitutional issue, courts around the country have made uh, have come to decisions on the federal side of this with respect to removal of um, uh, firearms, the allowability of requiring relinquishment, and uh, pretty much universally have decided that it is allowable under the federal uh, analogy to what we're doing here uh, in terms of making people prohibited persons. So I think we're on pretty safe ground on this constitutionally. Uh, but just wanted to clarify that when we're looking at those burdens of proof, that's not really the constitutional inquiry. Um, I think there were some questions about reasonable suspicion and probable cause and how officers are going to find that, how courts are going to find that. Um, again, Attorney Fitzpatrick, I think, correctly talked about how it's hard to reduce that precisely. But I would also note that this is the type of work that uh, police and judges do all the time. We're not introducing something new. We're not introducing something that is that they're going to be unfamiliar with. It is certainly not easy, but it is the type of work that gets done constantly, and I don't see this as being a new burden or something that they'll have trouble handling. Judge Gerson brought up some points about um, whether or not evidence is going to come in with respect to firearms and how judges will deal with that or might be able to deal with that or not. I think it's important to note generally that Courts always deal with the challenge of sufficient evidence. It will be the case that there are times under this bill, maybe many times even, that there is not sufficient evidence to make uh, a finding that, um, about, or to make a, fi a specific finding about weapons, and that's okay. I mean, that, that is the world we deal with. Sometimes relief from abuse order requests are filed and the affidavit isn't sufficient to issue one. That is part of the world we live in, and I don't think that's a reason not to try to make things better, which we believe this bill will do. Um, that's you know part of the challenge, and uh, that courts deal with all the time. It is not new, and I don't think that's not a reason to do something. Uh, Judge Gerson did mention the uh, issue of making a finding. I think the way that we would, or the way the statute is written now, where there's a presumption that it will be done unless there's a finding that it shouldn't be done, a specific finding that it shouldn't be done. The way I would, our office would read that and the way that we would expect many judges to look at that is to say, all right, if there isn't sufficient information, you will issue the relinquishment order. Because it's saying, issue the relinquishment order unless there are sufficient facts to tell you not to. So the absence of facts, we believe, as the statute is currently written, would lead to the issuance of the order. And we think that's perfectly appropriate given the uh, serious public safety issues at stake, which we discussed extensively when we first took up the bill. I did note that Judge Gerson also said that um, if there is evidence of firearms, there could be a mandatory relinquishment order. I think we would support that, too, if the judge feels more comfortable with that. We think that's a good way of accomplishing the goal as well. Um, so uh, 
I'd like to interject a couple of things. So I want to sort this between final order and the temporary order. So on the final order, it seems like we can just uh, have the relinquishment order, period, that the, the court should issue that because when that final order is issued, it is now illegal for that person subject to that order to possess firearms, you know, period. So, which, which, so that seems pretty straightforward. Uh, um, the only question is if there was a temporary restraining order already put in place and requiring relinquishment, you know, is, do you really need to have relinquishment and get in the final order? But I'm going to put that aside. So on the emergency relief, just what you were saying, like, unless there's evidence to the contrary, you issue the relinquishment order. Uh, given Judge Rearson's testimony, I'm a little troubled by that because there's, it, it's an ex parte proceeding, and there's nobody to be countering whatever evidence that the victim or plaintiff is putting forward. I mean, so I mean, it's whatever the victim puts into the affidavit uh, in complaint. Uh, that's the only evidence, presumably, in front of the court. Uh, so if the, if the victim doesn't put any firearms, list firearms. I think, you know, we need to make that affidavit much clearer. You know, we, I've looked at that affidavit, and it's not specific enough. It's not asking uh, the victim uh, for the presence of firearms. And, and, but it's, I, I just don't know how that works. If there's absent information, we're just going to say relinquish firearms. So a couple main points I'd, I'd make on that. One, ex parte orders are a rare tool in the court systems because of what you're saying. They, they don't allow for a response immediately, although they always require an eventual hearing, and they do here as well. But the ex parte relief from abuse order right now does, you know, courts have interpreted to allow for the relinquishment order, so it's not actually changing that by, by doing this. It's just making it more likely to happen. And they already allow for very significant impositions on somebody's liberty. They have stay-away orders. They have no-contact orders. They have um, ex uh, vacate orders. Um, those are really significant um, as I said, impositions on somebody's liberty, and those are allowed to happen now. I don't think that we're actually changing that much by doing that. Again, ex parte orders are an unusual tool that the courts for the courts to exercise, but they exist here because there's a understanding, and they've been certainly been found valid uh, here and everywhere. Uh, because there's an understanding that there are serious public safety interests at stake, and we need to be able, the state needs to be able to respond to those quickly. Um, so I don't see this as changing anything significantly. The other point I would make is that, with respect to the difference between the initial order and the final order, if this bill passes with that change to Title 13 on the prohibited persons, uh, e under either order, somebody's going to, after the issuance of either order, somebody's immediately going to become a prohibited person. Um, so it will be unlawful for them to hold firearms. I still think you know, that this legislation is important to include the order part of it because enforcement is important and letting people know that they are not supposed to have weapons is essential. So I don't think that you can just rely on this piece of law that probably most people are never going to know about or certainly are not going to know about initially um, to affect the change that you need to see affected with respect to getting weapons removed. Well, but are the notice to victims is in what they have to file with the court for the ex parte order. And having looked at it, right now it doesn't ask to list uh, or explain the presence of firearms. Uh, I think if you put that into that affidavit, and they have to answer that. And if they answer that there are firearms, then yeah, you, you issue the relinquishment order. But if the answer is there, there are no firearms, then the, the reason, to, the, uh, the counter to what you're saying and the reason it, uh, to do this is when law enforcement, I mean, when we say relinquishment, we're putting a whole new uh, obligation on law enforcement. Uh, and if 
therefore say relinquishment every time, even if there are no firearms, there's no evidence of firearms. And we've made very explicit that the victim has to, you know, that's one of the things that they have to state, no firearms or here are what I know about the firearms. You know, if that's not there, why have that relinquishment order at that stage of the game? I mean, I understand, you know, we're trying to capture as much as possible, but the, the, the pushback on this is, if you have 3,000 RFAs and a bunch of them are narrower, they're just seeking narrow relief, or a bunch of them have no evidence of firearms, it, it seems we should exclude that from that. At least this is what I'm, I'm you know, certainly hearing from other witnesses. And right, and, and so the point, your point is that we should, let me make sure I'm hearing the question correctly and then I'll try to answer it. The, the, point you're trying to get an answer to is um, we should only have these orders uh, go out when we have good evidence for firearms. Is that the? I'd say any evidence. I mean, the evidence being what is on the affidavit, which is insufficient now, a new affidavit that, that says, are there firearms present? If so, identify with as much specificity as possible. If that's in there, order gets issued, or relinquishment order gets issued. Uh, if it's not there, there's not any evidence. And it also gives, it gives uh, an opportunity for the court to have some discretion if it's just seeking, I don't know, stay away. I don't know, you know what order, stay away order, I suppose, or just a vacate order. You know, that's all that the victim is seeking uh, on that form. You know, put that part aside. I think really the part is really, is there any evidence of firearms? Right, I mean, I think so. I would proceed with the discussion assuming that we have a good form, so we don't have to worry about what that might be. Let's assume there's a good form that will elicit or ask for the information that we want to uh, get at. And I think that this again goes back to the fundamental question of why are we doing the bill? And it's because there is a deep concern that there has not been sufficient attention paid to the issue of firearms in intimate partner violence situations, and we need to do better with that. And again, the network um, and Assistant Attorney General uh, Hansen have spoken to that uh, extensively. Um, we need to shift the thinking in the state uh, among law enforcement in terms of, and, and courts, in terms of how we're focused on that, and that's why there's this presumption towards uh, paying attention to that. Again, the process may roll out in a way that, it, I should say the process in any particular case, may roll out in a way that, um, okay, there's an order issued, law enforcement um, is now required to do some investigation on that, which it will be, it will remain within their discretion in terms of how, how much they do there. Um, and it may be that there's no probable cause, and then there's also uh, nothing results from a, there's no reasonable suspicion, in which case it really doesn't go forward at all, or there's reasonable suspicion and they don't develop probable cause. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to result in uh, a warrant issuing for seizing the weapons in any particular case. So I think it's important to remember that this remains a case-specific inquiry and always will. Um, but the point is to change the weight of the assumption towards protecting survivors from firearms. Um, and, and addressing that serious public safety issue. I think if another way I would address your question is perhaps your concern, or the concern you're expressing, I should say, is a, would be better addressed by Judge Gerson's proposal, which was to say if there's any evidence, then it will be a shall. Issue. Well, that's what I was suggesting. Yeah, that, is, that was what I was suggesting, but I'm understanding what you're saying as well. But if we're going with who shall issue a period, I, I think the clear and convincing evidence language, I, I think that after Judge Pearson, that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, so putting that aside, so if it's some form of you shall do this, I'm still concerned of that it's, there's no longer any discretion in those instances where the court really thinks that it has a sound basis for not issuing the relinquishment. The judge gave us some examples of that. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but that's my concern. 
And, and one way to resolve that is if there's any evidence, any evidence in that affidavit that's newly formed and asks that question, then it shall be issued. Right, that's one way. Right? I think that's a fair way to do it, and I think that does go along with what the judge was saying. And again, I would also point out that we, you know, anytime any of these orders is issued with or without a um, relinquishment order, somebody's going to be a prohibited person, assuming that that piece passes. So, well, except. That I'd love you to throw one other item out there. If this is the approach that we go, uh, if it is something along the lines that there has to be some evidence, then I think that other provision uh, would have to be modified. And I'm looking at page 9, section 4, the person subject to relief from abuse orders, prohibition on possession of weapons. Uh, I think we would have to add that um, Let's see, a person shall not possess, ship, transport, or receive a firearm if the person is the subject of an emergency relief from abuse order. I think we'd have to add language there. That includes a requirement for relinquishment of firearms. In other words, yeah, if we don't have language there, then we might as well say shall because it's going to be illegal for you to possess firearms, period, in any instance that an RFA is issued. And so, again, that's taking away the discretion from the judge, and if we believe the judge that there's some instances where they want to have that discretion. I respectfully disagree with that position. The, it is currently the law, under federal law and state law, that anybody who's the subject of a final relief, of relief from abuse order is a prohibited person. It doesn't matter if there is any specific finding here or anywhere in the country that the relief from abuse order said anything about guns. And it has been repeatedly found by federal courts that that is okay. Right, and in the final relief from abuse order, there is an opportunity for contesting that, and, and the due process concerns are taken care of. So there, there is a little bit of a difference there. I do also understand that at the temporary emergency relief stage, that's the critical time period. That's obviously what we're balancing here. But if we don't have that language that I just suggested, yeah, we might as well just say shall, because you're not supposed to possess firearms if an RFA is issued, an emergency RFA is issued, period. That, that would solve it, I suppose, as well. Right, and again, I would also come back to the earlier point, which is that, sure, ex parte orders are a huge liberty, or can be a huge imposition on somebody's liberty, not just in the gun situation, but in other really significant ways in terms of how they can move through the world, uh, where they can live. I mean, those are drastic interferences in somebody's life. And those are allowed under ex parte orders right now. And adding, and those are temporary conditions where if a final hearing is not held, they will go away. Uh, because somebody, because of the point you're raising, which is that somebody does have to eventually have the, and in pretty short order, have the ability to contest those conditions. Um, the addition of this one piece of it uh, is in line with what we already did with respect to the ex parte orders. So let me, okay. so let me throw one other concept out here. So, all right, so if you have a relief from abuse or emergency relief from abuse order, no discretion, it has to be relinquishment all the time. And, and again, Judge Grissom suggested there are instances where it just makes no sense. But now you, have this provision that says, well, if there's a relief from abuse order, you cannot possess firearms. Um, a couple things. First, I already mentioned, does that put more burden than we have to on law enforcement? Maybe not. They, they go out and they serve the order. There's no information that there are firearms, but they can do some more investigation. Yeah, I can understand that. But could there be an unintended consequence where individuals will not seek an RFA that is narrower because they don't want uh, to impose this relinquishment uh, requirement or the non-possession of firearms requirement on whoever they want the RFA against? I mean, you know, is it, I, I met, I've, yeah, yes, we want to get firearms out of the situations, but there could be a situation where the victim doesn't want that component of it. And maybe the victim no longer seeks the relief from abuse order. Or maybe the court looks at when there's a real narrow uh, request uh, for a relief from abuse order, uh, he, 
he or she doesn't issue the order because of the broad consequences with respect to firearms. You know, I, I'm just, you know, that there are some probably, I'm trying to think, there's some probably downsides to having no deference, and that's what this is suggesting. So a couple things, depending on how it's written, it may be the case that uh, if somebody doesn't add any information, and again, this will depend on the <coughs> direction we decide to go, let's say we go in Judge Garrison's direction where there's a shell, an instance where there's evidence of firearms. Uh, somebody doesn't write anything down, that part of the order won't likely, or likely won't issue, or at least there will be discretion. Uh, it will remain in the court's hands if there is no evidence that's presented in the affidavit. And just one real quick. And then it becomes inconsistent with the other provision that says you are not allowed to possess firearms if you have an emergency relief for the resort. And again, that goes, so we're doing two different, I, I agree that to some degree this is a belt and suspenders thing, uh, because in the final order, too, we're asking for a order, even though they're prohibited. And there's, I don't think there's any argument that we, that that piece of it is uh, acceptable. It clearly is. Um, but the point of the order is the knowledge and the um, directive to the police to follow up on it. There is something happening because of that order that wouldn't happen without it, and that's important. Um, so it's both giving notice, saying you can't do this, and, and that notice is, I think, a necessary part of this. People don't know all of, of the criminal code. Uh, and it's also, as this bill is structured, giving a directive to the officers to make an inquiry about, about that, and that's, maybe the key aspect of the bill. Um, all right. Yep, no, I, I appreciate that. Okay, yeah, no problem. I was just saying if you, you had more follow-up on that. Um, <coughs> a couple other points I want to make, and actually some that go, that return a little bit to what you were just saying. Um, Judge Gerson expressed some concern about judges asking about firearms. And I, it's my understanding, and the network will speak more to this, I'm, I think, in a few minutes, uh, victims advocates or survivors advocates would like that inquiry to be made. Um, in other words, you, it, this actually goes to the point you were just making a little bit. Is there a concern that people won't come forward because of this relinquishment order? Um, or, or the potential for this relinquishment order? Would that prevent people from coming forward? Part of the issue is that there is a concern that if it is on the survivor's shoulders to make the request, that does expose them to greater danger, potentially. And it is an intimidating factor that could prevent them from coming forward. If, on the other hand, it's the court's obligation to ask and to act, the, uh, I believe that it's that, there is, that the network, network position is that that is a good thing because you are removing the obligation from the survivor to make that affirmative request. But we're, the court doesn't want to ask these questions. It's not its job, I don't think, to ask these questions uh, necessarily. But if we just say you shall issue the relinquishment <coughs> order, period, because it doesn't matter because we have this other part of the law that says you can't possess firearms if there's an emergency relief order, that, that's the connection there. Uh, then it puts it on law enforcement if they get the order and we're asking, you know, we're requiring that part of that order specify any information about firearms. So there's no information there. It's still putting the obligation on law enforcement to, when they serve the order, presumably to start the investigation, ask about it, and maybe that handles what you're, you're after. Uh, well, I would say it should be the court's job to inquire about firearms, just as they currently inquire about where somebody lives, what the contact conditions are, because they have to figure out how to formulate these orders. So I wouldn't say that, that it shouldn't be their job. If it is already the case that they are allowed to issue um, no, firearm, uh, no firearms rule, part of the concern behind this bill is that that isn't happening sufficiently, and it needs to happen more. Um, so if this is in there, they probably, or they, again, it will be up to the judges. That discretion about what they ask about will remain. But they probably should, in more cases, be asking about this, and that's as it should be. So why, why are they asking if we're going to say you, should, you shall do this? You shall issue the relinquishment order? Well, okay. under either formulation, under either uh, standard, um, it, you know, again, a judge could decide not to say something, which wouldn't from our policy standpoint be a good idea. But 
uh, under either standard, they could ask for information because under the standard as it's written, they could be looking for whatever reason for clear and preponderant, you know, um, uh, clear and convincing evidence, excuse me, for a reason not to issue the uh, order, in which case they would have to make a factual inquiry to do that. Or under Judge Grierson's suggestion, where it's like, if there's evidence, you shall issue, then again, they'd have to look for uh, facts on which to make that rule. So under either circumstance, there should be some inquiry. Again, it'll ultimately be up to the judge, but we think that's the right policy outcome. And it is protective for, sur for survivors, and it makes survivors more likely to come forward if it's not on them to do that. I assume the only reason why a judge wouldn't ask a question is because they're prohibited not to? Sorry, still learning. <laughs> I mean, which is what our job is in here is to go and not ask uh, too many personal questions. Or I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. I mean, it's like we prohibit what they can and cannot ask, or, or I certainly don't. I would view the RFA statute in general as permitting inquiries that are, it doesn't require inquiries, it doesn't prohibit inquiries, but it allows for inquiries that are, by their nature, quite personal. Um, these are often very personal, intimate situations between people, and um, I think they're very, they can be very challenging hearings for people who are involved in them because of that. Uh, that's the reality of the world we're dealing with when we talk about relief from abuse order hearings. Thanks. Another point that was uh, brought out both by the judge and I believe the commissioner was getting at this a little bit too was with respect to um, the police process that is proposed to be happening. And again, this is to ensure that there is an adequate inquiry after an order is issued. Um, and that is the one of the key aspects of what's going on here is the, uh, and again, the network will be able to speak to this. They are the experts on this, but just want to make the, the point that that is why that section of the statute is there. We need to make sure that officers are following up on this. Uh, and there is an understanding now that that is not always happening. I have no doubt that the Vermont State Police, which is the department that Commissioner Sherling supervises, is doing a good job with this stuff. They are, they do a very good job. They are one of 74 or so departments in the state. And the point is to standardize this inquiry and to make sure that it's happening. There's nothing in that section that removes police discretion in terms of how they prioritize things or when they address things or if there's emergent situations that they need to attend to, they can do that. There's nothing in that section that prohibits that or prevents that. And I will say that the law about liability on this sort of thing, about when police choose not to do something, which is how cases usually come forward, is very favorable to police. It's very hard to bring a successful um, lawsuit against police because they prioritize their, their day. That it's widely understood both under federal Supreme Court case law and Vermont Supreme Court case law that police retain broad discretion even when there's a statute that tells them they should do something. In fact, even when there's a statute that tells them they shall do something, the courts have still interpreted them to be able to make uh, discretionary decisions. And I think that this law is written in a way that um, cle they clearly retain discretion. Um, Commissioner Sherling brought up a point about, well, we don't want to focus too much on the warrant, because there could be warrant requirement exceptions. Um, I think, of course, there's warrant requirement exceptions. That's constitutional law. That has nothing in this bill changes that constitutional law. Those remain. If uh, somebody would be more comfortable, if there was a statement saying that in the law, I think that's fine. But I don't think it's necessary. I think warrant requirement exceptions are there now, and they will remain. Um, but again, I think the underlying point is we do want to uh, make sure that this inquiry is happening. But we are not burdening the police's discretion to make decisions about prioritization. They have it now, they will retain it. 
Um, and that actually goes to the next point I was going to make. Now I'll delve into a little bit more specific language. And I know we're running up against the end of the time, so I'll try to run through this very quickly. But uh, the 48-hour piece, I think that saying it'll happen within 48 hours or um, as soon as practicable certainly leaves open the discretion that we're talking about. There's really two times when that would come into play. Uh, one is um, in the station house, in police stations, where officers are trying to decide what to do. Again, I think the director is pretty clear. Do it in the next couple of days. But if something comes up, do it as soon as you can. Uh, the next book, the only other time I think that language would really come into play is if somebody brings a lawsuit. And again, I want to emphasize, that's really hard to do. It almost never happens. And it certainly almost never happens successfully. Uh, and the fact that that language clearly leaves the discretion of the police means that we have no issue with liability <coughs> attaching. The only other piece of point I'd make at this point, uh, relatively small, on page 13, I think Judge Grierson did actually raise a fair point about um, saying, or the public, with respect to who we're trying to protect. Maybe that wasn't on page 13. That was on, sorry, that was on page 5. Yeah, page 5 through 7, I think. Um, I think that's a fair point. This is about protecting survivors uh, and that could be changed. It could be changed to eliminate or the public or to borrow the language from page 13. I believe it was on page 13 where we have language about um, uh, health, white health or well-being of a victim. Yeah. So I think that that could be a um, substitute for the or public. That's more of a detail-oriented piece that we can work on. Um, those are the pieces I had. Happy to answer any more questions. Well, it, it seems to me that looking at the emergency uh, relief or abuse order again, that there's one of two approaches, and maybe there are more, but that's the ones that I have in my mind. One is it just says shall relinquish, period. Uh, because we have this other provision, which is going to make it illegal to possess a firearm anyway if, if that order issues. So then it goes to law enforcement, and if there's information that was provided by the uh, by the victim on the affidavit, or if the court inquiries, that will be part of the order. So the, the law enforcement will have some indication that there are weapons or not, or firearms or not. But if not, there's this relinquishment order, and the law enforcement will do what they do. They'll presumably investigate when they go to an issue or serve the order. Presumably, they'll ask the individual if they have firearms because they're supposed to relinquish them, and if they are suspicious that they do, they can get a warrant. So, so that was like the one process, it seems to me. The other is that the court, uh, if there is any evidence of the presence of firearms, or that the, that the perpetrator, the defendant, has uh, access to firearms, or possessions, or owns, or however the language is, then it shall issue the order. In that case, we have to modify that the uh, offense, the new offense, <coughs> that it applies only to relief emergency of orders that include the relinquishment. That that seems to be the two avenues. I don't know if other people. I mean, for for you to ponder further, I guess. I will happily ponder. I think that again, I would. My legal sense of what's allowable is that under either. Let me start that whole thought again. The. Um, way in which we direct judges to make this decision doesn't necessarily affect, doesn't ha I don't see a, a necessary legal connection between that and the prohibited person's decision. I, I see your argument about that. Again, as I've already expressed, I don't. My feeling on that is that it, we don't need to put the caveat that you're suggesting. Well, only, um, if, only if there's uh, going to be RFAs issued without the relinquishment. But again, I go back, and I see, I understand your point that it's ex parte, and therefore we should look at it differently. But if we go back to the final order situation, there are plenty of orders that get issued here and are all over the country without any language about that, and people remain prohibited persons right. without that. And to my, you know, my argument earlier had been, and remains, <laughs> that uh, the ex parte order already, <coughs> setting the whole issue of guns aside, has significant liberty impositions. 
and that is allowable. Uh, and this is um, this is adding one more in terms of the prohibited persons piece. Again, or the relinquishment order is currently law and it's currently allowable, so I don't want to exaggerate what we're doing here. Uh, we are not drastically changing what's permissible. We're just making it more likely to happen. Um, in adding the adding that sort of prohibited persons piece, which is a time limited thing that will go away if no final order issues. Um, I don't see it as being a significant addition or one that is necessarily tied to how we um, have the judges, well, you know, the extent of discretion the judges have. Then it just, I mean, if that's the case, it just seems to me we should say shall relinquish, period, whenever there's an order issue. I think, I understand your point on that. I think that certainly that's the way forward. That's what we supported at the beginning, yeah. and I have no problem with it. I, and it's, it's possible that Judge Gerson was concerned. We'll have to ask him further that it, it was go, it was a fact that that automatically led to a civil warrant, and now, now it, it doesn't. That's right. So perhaps there's less concern, perhaps. I think that may be right. And again, I, I certainly don't think there's that any issue. We supported that initially, but we would still support that solution. All right, thank you. Great, thanks. All right, so people want to take a break for lunch, quick break, keep going. We have Sarah, I don't see Bill the, Moore. Um, the Women's Caucus has the new um, ah, paper commissioner. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. okay, from, um, is it like noon to one or something like that? All right, then, um, Let's get back here at, at one.